Welcome back, you here with Goldberg. Today we'll be talking about recent financial events and the limits of market fixated ideology on the internet.com. So I was reading Aaron Clary's book on the housing collapse, quite fascinating. I'll put a link to it if you're so inclined. I don't want to call him a libertarian as that's perhaps too loaded. Let's say disgruntled capitalist. He wants the government to get out of the way. He likes deregulation, but then even he admits these firms were doing money mischief. They were giving loans to people who could not afford and uh, we're not going to be able to pay it back. Oh, he's a good guy. Don't worry about it. He'll be fine. And so they were very much the cause of this disaster. He also goes on to note that there should be some kind of controls. So he doesn't really specify should it be government or industry driven. You have to remember that Wall Street had a financial advisory board. It was supposed to regulate it, but it was staffed by Wall Street. So no surprise there. Um, Bernanke himself in his memoir admits that they could have put in place controls on lending at the Fed, but this was just the general culture and mentality going back to Greenspan, who was a devotee of Ayn Rand. Now, he didn't eliminate the government, as we know, but he said, get out of the way. So low interest rates might stimulate lending, growth, that sort of thing. Don't try to control and determine private businesses. The main issue with that, of course, is that they don't really self-regulate. Let's be real. Uh, that's That should be happening, ideally. If the regulators aren't doing it, the company should be doing it themselves, but they're not. Clary would say, oh, the government incentivizes them by bailing it out. However, you have to recall, TARP failed, I think, the first two votes. It was very controversial, so not guaranteed by any means. And in the past, the government was not bailing banks out. Like if you go to the 1800s, some of those panics. 1907, I'm almost certain I'm correct, that was J.P. Morgan who stepped in to bail out the industry because they made stupid decisions. So the idea, oh, if you just let them do their own thing, they're going to be fine. I think there's very strong arguments on both sides. And like, to be honest, they don't self-regulate. But what happens, I've seen this, people who are against regulation or who will actually lobby to prevent regulation or water it down, get it repealed, will then turn around and say it doesn't work. One of the loud uh, you know, voices that you've heard in the aftermath of SVB is, on the one hand, Cato Institute saying, no, the Dodd-Frank legislation, by the way, my opinion, it was terrible. It was not strong at all. It was written by Wall Street, which, just like Gabriel Kolko said in the progressive movements, a lot of those reforms were written by Wall Street, so they were not too effective. But other people on MSNBC were claiming, no, in fact, the it's like the monthly liquidity check would have caught them and would have prevented this disaster my takeaway is you need much stronger state oversight and you have to be careful again because stuff like dodd frank it's so influenced by industry that is it actually going to be effective and maybe you need to stop allowing regulatory capture bring in competent people who aren't just handpicked by these financial entities What's rather odd, though, is that many of these online libertarians, sorry, I'm using the term and I shouldn't, such as Clary and others, they adopt a mentality that is, on the one hand, you know, the private sector is good. Look at all the services and stuff we can afford. It's fantastic. It's better than socialism. You've always seen those memes. This is capitalism. This is socialism. We're more prosperous. We have growth. We have development. But a lot of the talking heads will promote almost an anti-consumerist minimalism and say you shouldn't partake like other people are doing, keeping up with the Joneses. And I'm very much on the same boat, so I'm not attacking them for that by any stretch. What I think is really fascinating, though, is that if you really consider the reason why our economy is this size, is it not because we've adopted this kind of you know, every man a king as long as he can finance it mentality. See, Clary will say in the 50s, you could make 25 grand. It was enough money. Your house was smaller. People uh, were prosperous without needing all this extra, you know, stuff they put on a credit card. But you have to remember, we were pretty much the manufacturing base of the world. A lot of the other major countries were, uh, they were still recovering from World War II. Others were just totally undeveloped, not fully industrialized. We had the advantage of being a superpower, so we could set the terms of much of the trade. We had much tighter immigration laws, which means that workers have negotiating power. 
and more labor union dominance. When you went to buy a house in the 50s, you might have to put down 50%, not 5% or, you know, put down $29 and drive away today. All that really began with uh, Peanut Carter. He deregulated the credit industry. Reagan obviously continued it. Billy Boy Clinton. So that was where any common man, any schmuck could get a credit card. You could uh, have a, a mortgage. Then gradually we see the cutting of interest rates these low interest rate type culture. I mean, even compared to today in the 1980s, there were pretty solidly high interest rates. So you had to be more careful if you were gonna go out and buy real estate or buy a car on credit on a layaway. So there's a big difference because our economy has expanded dramatically, which gives currency to the argument, oh, capitalism is better than socialism. At the same time, that is because we've adopted this kind of casino capitalism. You can give loans to everyone, even if they have no credit. The question is, should we continue on that model? Because it has led to a situation where decent jobs are fleeing. You have a lot of cheap labor competition. Uh, people, they can't save. There's no incentive to, so they tend to consume more. And then you have to rely on a 401k, which is not a very efficient means to save for retirement because you just keep dumping money in and then it goes down. You got to buy lower and does it even out in time? Uh, lots of different issues with that. So you might figure that capitalism enthusiasts would be big fans of that, you know, give people credit regardless, because that does allow the economy to grow by leaps and bounds. But of course, it leads to a situation where you have more instability. And if the people are mimicking the governments, the government's borrowing and spending, and taking loans, people are doing the same thing. So it, it doesn't necessarily create the best financial picture over the long run. Now, if you were to crack down on that, not just by telling people to change their behavior, but in fact, making it harder to get loans, higher interest rates, I think that would be better for a country overall. There is a flip to it, which is that the guy who comes here with just a shirt off his back can't get easy credit. He might not be able to start a business. So there's going to be a trade-off, but there's this tendency to assume that's just how the system has to be or the reverse, what would be better this way? There, nothing's perfect with economics. That's why when you have this, these obsessive ideologies, whether it's the Ayn Rand style approach to capitalism or it's the total state planning, they end up being very inefficient, probably more inefficient than something that's in between, at least in my opinion. I'm not saying it's fact, but it probably is. In the case of SVB, it's interesting because a lot of people talk about fractional reserve. They didn't have enough to cover oh, it's a disaster. And if you stop for a second, you go, yeah, but fractional reserve banking, much like not forcing people to separate commercial and investment banking, those are part and parcel to allowing the market to be more free. You're saying we're not going to have some you know, nosy bureaucrat come in and muck things up. It's going to be up to you. You self-regulate, you do what you have to do, and it'll be okay. Well, as you see, often there is a disaster. Or the conservatives saying, oh, it's ESG, it's wokeism. And just as a side, people who complain about wokeism and want to fight it as some, you know, boogeyman like feminism, they don't understand it's a byproduct of a much larger issue. And then they claim we should stand with MLK, just lowest IQ possible. I can't stand listening to those types. They're just horrendous. But I don't think this is about ESG and wokeism. Yeah, they had some women in leadership positions, but most of that's astroturfed. They're not making the real decisions. You know, it's a fusty old Care Bear or maybe one of the last wasps or possibly a, uh, an electric wind turbine guy that's doing it. It's not the women. It's not the minorities. That's just a distraction that they're throwing some bones to the morbidly obese Shaniqua down the street. So... What's really going on, and we talked about before, banks have collapsed in 2008, they collapsed in 1907, well before all this wokeism was a factor. So that's, to me, not a very credible argument. You can claim diminishing IQ, but again, collapses have happened in the past. It's this issue fundamentally where, and if you go back to Cicero and Adam Smith, they were some of the forerunners, of the concept of free market, but they believed you have to have the producer class that acts ethically and also the statesmen, the ruling class, the, the men of wisdom and stoicism who act with wisdom. There's an equilibrium. If you get away from that, you have what we experience where we have corrupt low IQ bureaucrats who are not the best of the best 
and we have people in the private sector who see everything as a means to their own ends. This is only made worse by the fact that if you screw up, you rarely face actual penalties. Unless you commit outright fraud, you're probably not going to go to jail. We're even see if Sam Bankman Freed is taken down. I'm not sure he will be. Think of that guy who was telling people to buy Bitcoin at $60,000, take out a second mortgage. Has he been fined or arrested? No. And so in, in some respects, I got to feel that these guys who are anti-regulation, anti-government, to some degree, some of them are doing it because they want to be able to scam people. What's even more disturbing, however, is how much of the crypto industry are tied up with these banks. And I'm not necessarily suggesting all of them are going to go bankrupt because of that, but they keep selling it as, oh, this is the wave of the future. You're not going to have the banking system. And yet they've got so many deposits wrapped up here. You've got uh, companies like the ones that were running Tether. They couldn't actually keep it matched to the dollar. It was going less. They don't have enough dollars on hand. I think USDC, they don't have enough dollars on hand to back that, even though they're claiming it. So there's a lot of, in, in truth, again, the crypto industry, much like these banks, they are operating in more of a free market wild west. There isn't much oversight, especially for crypto. And this bad behavior is happening because people know they can scam the little guy and there's not going to be any real consequences. I mean, we can make fun of the fact that the FDIC only insures up to 250000 but they don't really have necessarily enough to back up these deposits. Well, think of a crypto. If your crypto is sitting on an exchange, there is no insurance to that whatsoever in, in almost every case. So are we really better off with no regulation? Should we have some? Should we have lots? I believe you need some. And I think that's across industries, because like I said, there's too many jokers running around. How many of those finance YouTubers were promoting FTX because they were going to get a kickback? They didn't care. They didn't investigate anything, even though they're personal finance advisors. But then if it's cold on them, oh, it's just satire. Well, I'm just joking, bro. I'm not an advisor. See, we have to start being serious about this because people are going to piss away their life savings due to the fact they were following a person. That, oh, I thought he was honest. I thought he was integrity. He had a lot of followers. This is an issue. All this is not to suggest that the government's going to come to save you. No. However, be aware of the environment you're operating in because people can tell you it's freedom, it's amazing, and they could just be sitting there trying to scam you. This is why I want to quickly address gold and crypto, and then we'll talk about some other ideas. Hopefully this video won't be too long when all is said and done. When I talked about Peter Schiff and how if you'd followed him from 2013, you missed out on tons of market gains. These... High IQ geniuses came in the comments section and were like, yeah, but if you denominate those returns in gold or crypto, it don't look good. And you're like, well, isn't that funny because we denominate gold and crypto in dollars, right? They say, look, the, dollar, the price of gold's gone up here. The price of crypto is this much in dollars, correct? With gold, and I should note, by the way, I put a citation in the conservatism book from, I want to say it was the, the text Naked Money. But he has a nice chapter. He breaks down. Gold has been manipulated for a long time by governments, by the private sector. The idea that somehow it's this magical, it keeps value forever. Yes, you could trade it in to make electronic components. But the idea that gold is this panacea financially is up for debate. By the way, I'm just going to say I do own gold, Bitcoin, and silver. All right, I'm just not one of these bugs about them. I, I see the limitations like anything else. Um, and you've seen, if you go see the price of gold, it doesn't even always go up in relation to the market having issues or excessive spending. So that puts a bit of a damper. With Bitcoin, guys would say when it hits 60, I'm a Bitcoin millionaire. No, you're not. You're a bit, you're a millionaire denominated in USD. If you had to hit 60 to become a millionaire, unless you cashed out to USD, put in real estate or put in your stocks, whatever it might have been, now that it's down to around 20,000 or 24,000 last time I checked, you're no longer a millionaire. So you don't have a million Bitcoins. I don't know if anyone does. So that's an important distinction as well. You're denominating in a currency you say is worthless, but that's the base of you being a millionaire. And let me tell you, if you had a million dollars in the bank, even if there is inflation, that's better than not having uh, that money. Uh, there's also, with Bitcoin, it's evolved. It's been like, oh, it's going to replace the dollar. Oh, it's an investment. Oh, it's a safe store of value. That latter one is the hardest to wrap your head around because it was lower, then it came up, 
went to 60, then it crashed. It kind of seesaws back and forth a lot. Again, a lot of big bank money, big finance money in Bitcoin. That's one of the reasons why you have to be careful. One of the reasons why you, Bitcoin, when the stock market went down, I think it was a year and a half, two years ago, Bitcoin was crashing. It wasn't like going in the opposite direction, which you kind of expect that, okay, now everyone wants Bitcoin because it's safer than the stocks, it's safer than bonds, it's safer than having your money in the bank. Technically, Bitcoin is an inflation hedge because only so many can be mined in total. Although I have heard compelling arguments that's not true. They could twerp with it if they wanted. I will stick with a traditional viewpoint, however, that only so many can be produced uh, at the end of time. What I would say is this. If you're going to get Bitcoin, based on all the stuff we just talked about, put it in a hardware wallet. You're going to have to buy that separately, Ledger or someone else, because... If all these exchanges you have your money on, if another FTX collapses, if Coinbase collapses, KuCoin collapses, remember, there is no FDIC. So you're just banking on them having enough assets to pay you off or the government stepping in. Oh, there we go. The government will save us. Just saying, put it there. And then there's like, yeah, but what about the central bank digital currency? We already have that with uh, credit cards and debit cards. If you do you know, trade work for cash, yeah, you'll be kind of screwed. But they were already been doing this, I think, in Africa. They pay each other with phones. India, they were removing the higher denomination bills because they wanted more taxes. It's inevitable. I'm not terribly obsessed with it because they can track almost everything as it stands, whether the law says they're allowed to or not. So I'm not going to you know, lose sleep over something of that nature. My advice to you, though, quickly back to crypto. You young guys, be careful with these altcoins especially if you're doing the staking, because every time they give you a payment, it adds as a transaction. So if you have to buy one of those crypto softwares for taxes, you'll get the most expensive one because you have too many transactions. It's a stupid system. That's how they do it. But what should you focus on investing in besides perhaps some gold or Bitcoin? Obviously land if you can develop it, but if you get stuff in the mountains, remember you might need topsoil if there's excessive shale there, or otherwise you won't be able to produce any food. REITs are a possibility if you don't want to mess with real estate, regardless of where interest rates end up. A lot of those projects are locked in on a long-term basis with loans, so you should be okay for a while. Or you could look at traditional stocks and dividend stocks especially. I talked about this in the book Immortal Investor. It came out a few years ago. During the Weimar Republic, when you had that inflation, the rich people put their money in stocks because it was a way to stay ahead of inflation or get paid dividends. And that's really just in general, focus on income. The boomer mentality of having the 401k where you withdraw from, not that there's no merit to it, but really focus on stuff that's gonna generate revenue on a regular basis because whether it's an online business, it's dividends, REITs, whatever it might be, that is a way that you can stay above inflation. That's the way you can relocate to another country that's cheaper if they let you leave. Uh, Inflation is not just about how much things cost, but it's about how much money you're making. So yeah, if you're just a wage slave and you're not making steps to uh, earn more or whatnot, you're not building those investments, you can, be, you might be struggling in the future, but at least if you have regular income, yeah, you'll have to pay taxes, but you might be able to stay ahead of the inflation and you might actually be able to get to a point where you don't have to work as much. We'll see, but just exercise extreme caution. Don't be too quick to believe in these market-related ideologies on a knee-jerk basis because a lot of these dudes, like I said, they've got a big audience. They have no regulatory requirements. They can tell you stuff and then walk away saying, oh, well, uh, I guess we'll be right, right next time, but you're in a bunch of debt or you're losing your house because you made stupid decisions. So be smart. And you know, if you, if you can't handle all the emotional you know, fluctu fluctuations, whatever, be a bogle head, just buy index funds, and you'll have a lot less stress.